1996, this Belgian slum revealed a bitter secret that would come to haunt the nation. The eyes of the world watched in horror. Into the light emerged two young girls. Leticia, aged 14, and Sabine, just 12, were the latest in a long line of girls who'd gone missing. Marc Dutroux, a convicted rapist and kidnapper, had led the police to where he'd imprisoned them. Relief swept Belgium as their tearful homecoming was caught on camera. But it soon turned to horror when police revealed the secret cage hidden in the cellar of Dutroux's house. The girls had been kept here, drugged, and repeatedly raped. But what of Belgium's other missing children? Eight-year-olds Julie and Melissa, who were missing for more than a year, and 12 others who'd vanished mysteriously. Was this a new lead in the hunt for them? The hopes of their parents were soon dashed. Within days, Marc Dutroux led police to the site where the bodies of Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo were buried. The parents were informed but when the Russos asked to see their daughter, Melissa, for the last time, they were refused. We begged, we were crying to see her. Really, we insisted with our lawyer, we really cried. They said, no, it's not possible, that's the law. But we said, what's the point of the law? And they said, it's for your own psychological good. It's not up to them to know what's good for our psychological well-being. What would have been good for us was to be certain. It's six years since the police unearthed the bodies of Julian and Melissa, buried in the garden of this house. What's extraordinary to me is that though Dutroux's in jail, he's never been tried for these crimes. It's as though the judicial system froze when faced with having to bring him to trial. Officially, Dutroux lived on benefits, yet this house, now derelict, was one of five that he owned. The bodies of two more missing girls were found at another, Effie Lambrex and Anne Marshall. I didn't believe that it was possible that uh, children were kept in in a cellar and were raped and and uh, kept there until that the Jew was killed, taken to prison and that he that we could see the cellar. At that moment, I had to believe. Before the murders, Mark Dutroux had already been convicted of five charges of rape and kidnapping. Yet somehow he'd served only six years in jail before he was released back into the Charleroi underworld. This was once Belgium's industrial heartland, but today its most famous industry is crime. Dutroux melted back into this realm of prostitution, drug traffic and stolen cars and began to plan his next project, the kidnap of children. For the parents now burying their murdered daughters after more than a year of fruitless searching, this was not the end of their nightmare. They would soon find out that Dutroux had been a prime suspect from the start, yet nothing had been done to save their girls. Melissa's father is still asking why his daughter was allowed to die. Ten days after the kidnapping of Julie and Melissa in 95, 
Three witnesses said it was Dutroux who's kidnapping children, but they don't go looking for Julian Melissa at his house straight after the kidnapping. It's inexplicable. And he continues to kidnap other children. They put a special surveillance unit to watch Dutroux and he continues to kidnap children. It's inexplicable. The whole thing is inexplicable from start to finish. What is known is that Dutroux was finally caught when his white van was identified. It had been used to snatch a sixth girl miles away from his home patch. The man who arrested Dutroux was Jean-Marc Connerot, an investigating magistrate. He became a national hero, uniquely respected by the parents of the murdered children. Yes, someone who wants to know the truth. You can feel it when you talk to him. You can feel that he wants to investigate, that he wants to have the truth. He is a very good magistrate. Conrad arrested Dutroux's associates. Among the first was Jean-Michel Nihoul. Nihoul and Dutroux had been seen at the site of the latest abduction the night before. They'd been in constant phone contact the day it happened. And the next day, Nihul gave £10,000 worth of drugs to an accomplice of Dutroux. One witness claimed Nihul had ordered a girl. Conorot knew Nihul had influential friends. He suspected he was the brains behind a network supplying clients with children to abuse. It's a charge Nihul denies. Conorot appealed to the public for information. When I saw him, Walking down the stairs, I thought that I knew everything about him. It was a shock. I thought, finally, they stopped him. Regina Loof was one of the first to come forward. She said that as a child, she'd been abused for many years in a paedophile network involving Nihul and Dutroux. I remember Jean-Michel Nihul as a very cruel man. He abused children in, in a very sadistic way. She says that at the age of 12, she was taken with other children to sex parties. And, she told investigators, Dutroux was there, working for Nihul. Dutroux was a boy who brought uh, drugs, cocaine and something like that, to these parties who brought some girls, or watched girls, on these parties. Nihul, he... He was a sort of party beast, <laughs> and the truth was more on the side. Nihul denies he's ever met Regina Loof, but her story's never changed. Nihul, she said, was one of those who organized the parties and invited the cream of Belgian society, judges, politicians and influential businessmen, in order to compromise them. It was big business, yeah. And it was very well organized, too. There's a lot of money going on there, and a lot of blackmail also. They had a lot of parties. They filmed it, even. So, yes, yes, it exists. I know it sounds crazy. And I know that there is a big taboo on everything like that. But it exists, you know. Regina Loof's story was horrific, but her account of a violent paedophile underworld was by now reinforced by new witnesses, some of whom also named influential people. The investigation began. The witnesses' identities were protected. Each was given a code name beginning with X. Regina was X1. They went up to X9. Their testimonies became known as Belgium's X-Files. The task of trying to verify them fell to a young police investigator. So we're telling stories we haven't heard before in our lives. Things we couldn't believe at the first. So we told ourselves, is this true? Could this be true? And when it is true, it's, it's very, uh, it's very, it's, it's frightening that things like that could happen. We had a special room for the interviews. It was specially equipped for people who have been victimized by such matters. There was a camera in the room. 
they were done mostly in the evening or the early hours. Uh, when the interviews were finished, they were written down by a few people of my team, all the way from the first word to the last, literally. But before the investigation could get underway, there was a bombshell. Jean-Marc Connerot, the man who'd arrested Dutroux, who'd saved the imprisoned girls, was sacked from the case. His removal caused a public outcry. Belgians lost faith in their judicial system. They descended on the Palace of Justice and accused the courts of colluding with the killers. The father of one of the murdered girls spoke for all. Ça revient un peu pour nous euh, à aller cracher sur la tombe de Julie et Melissa. Il y a un juge, Conrot. There's an investigating magistrate, Conrot, who arrests ten people. And they sack him and they appoint another investigating magistrate, Longlois, who's never done the job before. It's his first appointment in the most important investigation, in the biggest file of the century. You're going to put in an investigating magistrate who's never done the job before? Can you understand that? 300,000 outraged Belgians marched through Brussels in a demonstration of grief and solidarity. This white march was the largest protest the country had ever seen. Belgians felt that the dismissal of Conrad was a betrayal of Dutroux's victims, that it signaled the end of any real search for a network. The two rescued girls were overwhelmed. The country's highest legal authorities had removed the only judge in which the public had any faith because he'd attended a fundraising dinner for the families of missing children. A conflict of interest, they called it, a lack of judgment. The government feared a revolution. I think there were a kind of insurrection climate, a kind of pre-revolutionary climate here. You know, the big uh, powers in Belgium, so the magistrates uh, and the political uh, circles, the government, the parliament, everything was totally discredité. Everything was totally discredité. No one knew what to believe anymore. Rumour and speculation spawned a variety of wild theories. He will instigate ultimate fear. A feature film suggested the whole affair was part of an extreme right-wing plot to destabilise the country. I'm very pleased, Victor. 300,000 idiots marching in Brussels. An ocean of white balloons. Magnificent. Pathetic and impressive at the same time. We really got them exactly where we want them. <laughs>